Okay, so in this video, I wanted to talk about a common hedge fund structure, which is a master feeder fund structure. And this is going to be pitched from the US tax perspective, right? And what I mean by that is if you have a US based fund manager or if you have US investors, how do you structure your hedge fund to accommodate the US investor base? and the US fund manager. Now, there's obviously uh, hedge fund structures out there that don't have US-based managers. They don't have any US investors. Um, so that structure might look similar to what we see on this slide deck, um, but not necessarily the same thing. So again, this is from a US tax perspective. So we have just one slide in front of us. We're gonna start at the top here. Uh, hedge fund, so what is a hedge fund? Well, hedge funds are actively managed um, private investment structures, right? So a hedge fund basically sets up an entity, they raise capital, cash, from accredited investors, and then the cash is invested in various types of publicly traded stocks, bonds, privately held companies, um, a lot of derivatives, um, and other kind of um, not-so-run-of-the-mill type of assets, right? Uh, now, hedge funds are generally actively managed. So what that means is that they have a hedge fund manager, staff, um, traders uh, that are basically constantly looking for investments. And even if it's not a buy and hold strategy, it might be an active trading strategy. You've always got somebody looking into different types of investment opportunities and deploying the capital um, in those types of products, right? So the hedge fund fee structure uh, commonly is referred to as a 220 or a 210 structure. So a 220 structure means that 2% um, of the AUM or the assets under management is going to be the management fee, a fixed management fee for the year. And that immediately goes to the hedge fund manager. So let's say you have a hedge fund with $100 million dollars in assets, the 2% fixed fee is gonna be two million. That's a $2 million fee paid to the manager right off the bat, regardless of what their performance is for the year. And then the performance fee is the 20 piece. So 20% performance fee means that if the hedge fund produces a return on investment, let's say um, 10 million, um, of the $10 million that they earned on the assets, 20% of that is going to the hedge fund manager as a performance fee, and the remaining 80% is allocated to the investors as their share of the profits, okay? So now let's look at the structure itself. Uh, hedge fund structures typically have three entities, right? So you have a master fund, this is the first entity, an offshore feeder fund, and then an onshore feeder fund. So the master fund normally set up in a tax neutral jurisdiction, tax Tax neutral basically means tax free. So you have Cayman, Bermuda, BBI. Um, the master fund is the entity that actually holds title to the assets. So this is the entity that'll open the brokerage accounts with Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, Schwab, TD Ameritrade, whoever you use as the custodian. And the master fund is also the entity that would invest in privately held uh, companies. So if a company was looking to raise capital, the contract between that company and the investors would be through the master fund, okay? So the master fund is uh, the one that holds all the cash and invests the assets um, in those various types of investments. Uh, offshore entity uh, two, the feeder fund here. The offshore feeder, uh, and again, this is from a U.S. perspective. The offshore feeder is also set up in a tax neutral jurisdiction maybe the same as the master fund. So if you have a Cayman master fund, you might have a Cayman offshore feeder. The offshore feeder is the one that issues equity to investors in exchange for cash. Um, and then ultimately the cash is then deployed into the master fund. Now the offshore feeder fund, um, basically this is the entity where non-US persons invest their money. So if you're not in the US and you want to invest in this master fund, you do it uh, indirectly through the offshore feeder. Now and the offshore feeder also will take investments from um, US tax exempt investors. Um, the reason why they go in there is because 
It helps avoid things like UBTI. Um, the, the tax exposure there beyond the scope of this um, video, but generally tax exempt investors and non-US persons go into the offshore feeder. The onshore feeder is the one for the US persons, right? So this is generally set up in Delaware. The onshore feeder is gonna be um, an, an LLC, tax as a partnership. It's gonna issue uh, membership units in the investors. And then the cash is ultimately invested in the master fund. Now, the reason why you have two different entities here as feeders is really because of US tax issues, right? The non-US persons don't want to go into an onshore feeder fund because it means that they're now exposed to US tax reporting. They're, they get a K-1. Um, they're in the tax um, net, so to speak, versus if they remain in the offshore feeder fund, um, the non-US person that's invested in the feeder doesn't have to worry about any kind of US tax reporting. Any taxes, if any, are just going to be absorbed by the offshore feeder, and then they're done. Um, so that's why we have two separate structures here as feeders for the master fund is really to limit the risk and exposure for those non-U.S. persons. Okay, so now let's just recap some of the tax implications based on the structure here. And uh, hopefully that'll clarify uh, why we have this two feeder structure in a typical master feeder hedge fund uh, arrangement. So the master fund, again, is generally a foreign corporation. Um, now, from a U.S. perspective, it's a master fund. It's a, it's a corporation for federal, or sorry, it's a corporation for foreign tax purposes. But what it often does is it files an election to be treated as a partnership for federal income tax purposes. And this is really done to benefit the onshore feeder investors. So the master fund invests in all these products, um, but it doesn't pay tax directly. All the taxes pass through to the owners. Um, and this is desirable because in a hedge fund structure, much like private equity as well, um, we don't want the entity itself to absorb the taxes. We want the investors to ultimately pay the taxes if any earnings are passed through to them um, in the event the entity is profitable. Now the offshore feeder fund is also organized as a foreign corporation. But this entity does not file any U.S. tax election. So this entity wants to remain a foreign corporation for federal tax purposes. And that's because if it remains a foreign corporation, um, it's essentially a blocker corporation, which means that this entity itself is responsible for all kinds of taxes paid on the pass-through income, um, which means that they absorb all of it and the investors on the other side don't really have to worry about any kind of reporting or any kind of tax obligations. Um, and so that's the um, general idea behind this offshore feeder fund remaining as a foreign corp for federal tax purposes. Now the onshore feeder fund, um, again, it's a US entity, either an LLC or LP, and it's always taxed as a partnership for federal tax purposes. And that's because this entity, again, wants to continue the mantra of being a pass-through taxable entity, right? So the, the onshore feeder fund gets a K-1 from the master fund, which shows its allocation of income and expense. The onshore feeder fund, again, files its own 1065 and passes through income and expense to the investors. Um, so there's pass-through taxation at both, level, at, at both levels. The master fund the onshore feeder fund, and then the investors are ultimately paying taxes based on their allocation of the income and expense. So um, that covers it for this slide. Um, I hope that was helpful, kind of high level master feeder structure issues for hedge funds. If you have any questions, please leave me a comment below. Happy to answer any. And I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. Thank you.